Hi, it's Corbett Harrison coming at you live, yet somehow recorded, here at the Harrison Household Home Office. Welcome to it. Today we're going to do another interactive notebook challenge. This one I call Top 10 on the left. Is that your left? Your left. Decalogue on the right. Um, just so you know, I could care less if you inverted them and put the top 10 on the right and the decalogue on the um, decalogue on the left, top 10 on the right, your choice completely there. As long as there are two lists of 10, that's the big idea with this interactive notebook challenge. Now here's a note about the interactive notebook challenges because I get this question a lot. Do I always assign what I want them to do as a page theme or as a challenge on the page? I do not. Eventually I want them to get to a point where they are on their own deciding how they want to present the information in an interesting way on their interactive notebook pages. Uh, I just give them early on lots of different suggestions because every time you try a new format you may hate it and say I never want to try that again but every time you try a new format you might see, might see some little element in that piece of writing that you did that will inspire you to maybe try something different later on. Many formats to show that you don't want everyone's to look the same. The same. What I always say to the kids is surprise me and you know you've done your writer's notes had a little problem with the computer here so let's get this PowerPoint going let's see if it'll work for me this time there we go the very first step of any interactive notebook page remember is that you read and process new content on any topic on the left or the first thing I will have my students do is they have to create a top 10 list prompt based on what they've read and the idea of the top 10 prompt and I'll talk about this much more in a few slides down is that you're attempt is to be smartly humorous about your topic. We'll talk about ways to do that. The other thing that I ask students to do is on the other side to create a decalogue. A decalogue is an old-fashioned word. It means 10 laws or 10 rules and the thing about having laws or rules is they're kind of written in a certain voice. Um, they're not necessarily unfriendly but they certainly are a more serious strict voice and so when we write our decalogues I challenge my students to capture that voice. It's good experimentation for them to try out different voices and then finally they take the top 10, they take the decalogue and they create a two-page spread whose ultimate purpose is to, your, your job is to sit down with someone and share what you've done, not only the content you've got, but also the process you went to create the page and to teach the other person about your content or teach the other person how you thought about the content, which may be different from the way that they thought about the content. So interactive notebook pages. I'm gonna do something different today. We're gonna go right for the main one. Here's my final draft. On the left, you're going to see my top 10 baby names for hummingbirds. On the right, you're going to see my decalogue. Normally, you'd see my rough draft first. Trust me, it existed. But I just thought I'd jump right in and do it differently today and say, here's what the final is going to look like. We'll go into details here. Let's talk about the top 10 side first. Um, David Letterman, boys and girls, was a comedian long ago. And he had a TV show, and he started his TV show off every time with a top 10 list. 10 funny observations about a certain topic, 10 funny observations about a celebrity, 10 funny things that he and his writers had thought about. Top 10 list. One of the ones that they came up with was the top 10 things never said on Star Trek. TV show or the movies, just weird things you would never probably hear them say. What made it funny when it was presented on um, the television show was he actually had the guy who played Spock in his serious, non-emotional voice read all these, so I'm not going to read them to you. I'm going to have you put the non-emotional reading voice in your head and read these aloud to yourself. Top 10 things never said on Star Trek. Number nine. Crazy crud like that. Probably my favorite. Now that one, number six, is inspired by current events that were going on at the time. I don't think anyone ever said that on the Star Trek Enterprise. I don't think anyone will ever say that on Maury, because it probably got canceled. That's another current event. Sort of Spock meets Surfer Dude there. And then finally, a joke about William Shatner's hair, which you may have to explain to your students, but 
Dave always tried to end on a zinger, and there was his zinger for this particular top ten list. That's a top ten list. It was funny on TV. People understood the format. Our good friend Barry Lane, the author, said, you know what? It's not hard to write top ten lists. He's the one who gave me the idea. On page 162 and 163 of his wacky research reports, you're going to find this example. Uh, the idea is that they studied what the Crusades were like, and here are his top ten reasons why you would want to be a Crusader. I would also counter that with the top ten reasons why you wouldn't want to be a Crusader. But if you read through those, it's filled with facts. We're reporting on facts that we're going to remember, but we're doing it in a personalized way. Here's a top ten list. Uh, I was thinking about all the topics that you might uh, build a top 10 list out, no matter what you're studying, if it's a topic that's got some depth to it. So you're studying the Incas, prime numbers, studying glaciers, top 10 things glaciers think about when they sleep. That's a funny topic. You can put lots of facts in those things, but here are some topic ideas I came up with. Uh, if you when, if if you want to teach this well, which is what I do, I don't just suddenly assign a decalogue. We do some practice decalogues long before it becomes an independent notebook challenge. Um, but there's a whole series of books by Scholastic. You wouldn't want to be this from history, very historically based. There's one called You Wouldn't Want to Be an Incan Mummy. Um, you can very easily go to your public library. You could check out 20 different titles of this exact book, um, all with different titles, and have the students and partners um, come up with a top 10 list based on just flipping through the book. Um, very simple to do here. The 10 reasons why you wouldn't want to be an Incan mummy. Um, that's the idea. Uh, one way to teach Decalogue. Now, here are my top 10 lists. Uh, I decided to come up with top 10 baby names for hummingbirds. Um, and my humor that I used was based on, I looked up plants that would attract hummingbirds. I was interested in that topic. And I started making funny names out of the plants. I thought that would be a good name. And so instead of trumpet vine, I came up with Donald Trumpet. Um, I don't know if Little Red Lupine is Little Red Corvette or if it's Little Red Riding Hood, but it's one of those two. Now you'll notice in black ink under each, each one. Um, I put a little fact about them that I've learned. Some of these I need to plant next year, some I already have. Um, I like Beard Tongue Penstamen III. It sounded like a very rich person's name. Beard Tongue and Penstamen are the same plant, but I thought that would be uh, an interesting way to present a baby name, a very rich sounding baby. Daylilies brought up the question in my mind, what happened to my daylilies? I used to have a bunch of daylilies and they don't exist anymore in my yard. So Sometimes when you're investigating in your interactive notebook, it leads to new questions. I'm going to investigate daylilies next. You have been warned. Um, for 6, 5, and 4, I did bee balm and bee bee. Those are the twins I decided. Bee balm is an actual plant I will be growing next year. I think it will bring a lot of hummingbirds. And bee bee is something I currently grow. It's short for butterfly bush, but I liked how the two names, bee bee and bee balm, would make twins. And then um, flowering quince. Kints, Kints, never sure how to say that one. I made it genetically altered because I read that if you get the variety um, that does not drop fruit, you'll be a lot happier in your backyard. It won't be as messy. So Now you may notice there, I also have a little worst five happening over there on the right-hand side of that picture. Um, let me show you that whole thing now. My top five also um, inspired a worst five, which is slowly loading here. I'm going to give it a second and see if it loads. What I did while I was investigating is I discovered that there are plants that hummingbirds like that my desert tortoises, which live in my yard, um, would consider to be poisonous. If they ate them, it would be bad. Oh, and here's my list. Um, I do uh, like foxglove and shasta daisy. I already knew about, but I wanted them on my list. Um, I did um, discover that I have sweet peas and lantana in my yard. Luckily, they're out of reach of my tortoises, but I'm going to need to be careful about continuing to those. I'm going to pause. Did a little pause there. My computer's acting like it's got a little memory issue going today. So um, now finishing my top 10 list. Um, I like saying morning glory, which is the name of a, a flower. So I thought if someone was named glory, that would be funny. Um, I went with catmint everdeen. Um, catmint is a real plant I will be planting next year. And it sounded like Katniss everdeen, but I thought my best name, my number one was instead of columbine, I came up with coal M. bine. Great name for a hummingbird. So it's the top of my top 10 list. That was my top 10 list. That's how it came to be. Now on the right-hand side, you'll notice I also have a Decalogue. Now please notice my Decalogue has been typed. 
Uh, before you ask, I do have a template that has little blue lines underneath it, and you can type on top of it if you know how to format a text box or a picture so that it sits on top of other things. Um, you can play with this format, and it allows me to type longer things that I can then tape down or glue down in my writer's notebook or in my interactive notebook, and yet it still looks like it's on a notebook page. Um, just email me, and I'll happily send you that uh, template if you're interested in using it or creating your own. But let's talk about how my Decalogue came about. First of all, what is a Decalogue? Decalogue is an old-fashioned word, 50% um, bottom of the words. Um, that's one of those words that if you type it in Word, it's so uncommon that it will probably underline it. Even though it is actually a word, here's the definition, it originally meant the Ten Commandments. If you see it capitalized, that's what it's talking about. But if it's uncapitalized, you can say that it's a basic set of rules from an authority, a list of rules a list of um, things that you're expected to do, a Decalogue. Um, one of my favorite uh, books is Because of Winn-Dixie, and I love chapter, I think it's chapter five. She asks in chapter four for ten things. Tell me ten things about my mama since I've never met her to her dad. And the whole chapter starts with the word one, and he just tells her ten memorable things so for her to know. It's a beautiful way to introduce the idea of a Decalogue if you're looking to teach it rather than assign it, uh, simply assign it. And so there's one suggestion I have for you. What's the thing about a Decalogue is you have to teach them to think about voice. Voice is this thing in writing that's really easy to spot, but it's difficult to teach. Um, students either have it or they don't. My best mentor long ago, Karen McGee, said just have students play with other people's voices and eventually they'll find their own. And that's kind of what I'm going to ask you to think about here. Think about if you were writing a letter of complaint versus a letter to a friend, you would use a very different voice. I'm not just talking about slang words. Um, I'm talking about the way that you would phrase things, the way that you would introduce and conclude things. You have a different style or voice to it. Um, same thing if you were writing a pamphlet that was intended to make people mad rather than convince them through ethos or uh, rhetoric, um, then you, uh, those would be different voices. And obituary in the newspaper sounds way different than a feature article, and encyclopedias sound way different than poems. These are the ideas of showing them what different voices means. Law has a voice to it. Right? Law is fact-inspired, and so um, I want you to think what laws are framed like. And I brought you some frames here. There's right out of the Bible, thou shalt not. You can go ahead and use that for every single law if you like. Um, or uh, if you want to go for other um, democratic kind of laws, no person, or in my case I was thinking hummingbird shall do this. That's a great way to frame your your list of 10 things, 10 laws. Um, these are right out of the Bill of Rights. Congress shall make no law that does this. This shall not be infringed upon. The right of the people in this area shall not be violated. You can find law frames anywhere. Use them. as you. The idea is to make it seem to have the voice of laws, even though they probably won't really be laws. Mine were just simply laws of the feeder. All right? And I was looking at ways to get hummingbirds to come to my yard and build more nests, and I wanted to know what their nests looked like. And so here's how my Decalogue happened. Um, the first four, um, first of all, they all start with each hummingbird shall, written at the top. The first four were all seek out. That was the verb I chose to use because I wanted them to seek out my yard. The next four were all build, about building their nests. I was looking for things that they will all do because this is these are facts based on what hummingbirds do. And then the last two, is it going to freeze on me again? It keeps freezing in the same spot. Let me pause. And the last two both start with the word gather. And so I have four verbs, four verbs, two verbs. That's how I chose to set this up. Ultimately, what I ended up with was this remarkable two-page spread about all sorts of things about hummingbirds that I'm going to revisit and rethink about all fall long and certainly into the spring. This is the interactive notebook challenge for the week, a top 10 list with a decalogue. Um, hey room. Oh, oh, and I did have an interactive element at the page. Um, I did have a page riddle. What's a group of hummingbirds called? There is a fancy name for it. I did put two clues on my page, which are pausing on me right now. There we go. It's also a kind of bracelet.
as a verb, it means this. Um, if you just type um, what is a group of hummingbirds called in Google, you will have the answer. But I put it as a page riddle. This is my page. Hey, in January of 2008, we're going to be introducing a whole bunch of videos on interactive notebook challenges at the Always Write website. If you like this idea, which I hope you do, I hope you'll visit back because not only will there be um, guided ideas like this, but lots of ideas for more freedom letting students build their own. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for visiting. Bye.